You are not sending information in the past. You are not actually twisting the present to have another outcome of what would have happened in the past. Actually, we do. Do you think that there is evidence for there being more than four dimensions? Depends what you mean. You see, I'm talking about space, particularly. Theories in physics involve the study of spaces with many more dimensions than before. In quantum mechanics, you have these things called Hilbert spaces, and these Hilbert spaces can be huge numbers of dimensions. They can be infinite dimensional. So it's not saying that extra dimensions don't play a role in physics. They do. However, they're playing a different kind of role. And the role that space plays in physics is very special. And you're talking about fields, which are functions of three dimensions of space. It's not even the four dimension. The fourth dimension is determined by the, the equations that your, your fields depend upon. So it would be a different kind of theory. I'm not saying you can't have theories with higher dimensions than, than three or four. It's just that the way that space comes into these and these dimensions we're going to be talking about space in the, in the way we mean space the trouble is also that things like string theory they require the tiny sometimes they say the dimensions are small, so small you have these little knots which are tiny tiny little things and to excite those extra dimensions you need an awful lot of energy and they say the amount of energy you need to excite those extra dimensions is so large that you would never see them, except with some accelerator, which is a million times power, more powerful than, than the CERN accelerator or something like that. But the argument seems to be quite wrong, because these extra energy that you need is for the whole universe. And there is easily that much energy in the whole universe. I, I think the, pro the problem is that you, you have to look into these theories if they're talking about space in the sense that we normally talk about space, then you, you, you'd be in trouble if you want to have more dimensions than two. I'm not saying that you can't think about it or something like that. You can. But the trouble is that they just don't make sense in the sense that the functions of these extra dimensions swamp everything else, and we don't see these swamping everything else. Okay. Well, it sounds like you're open to thinking about it. Claudia, you were sort of uh, arguing for that. I mean... Do we have any evidence for there being anything more than four dimensions? We have no evidence for uh, having been more than four dimensions. But be before we go to the evidence, maybe it's useful to understand how we would look for evidence. And that will depend a little bit on, on those extra dimensions. There's different ways we can think of extra dimension. And by that, I mean extra dimensional space. Um, but for extra dimensional space, you can think of those extra dimensional space that we don't see in our everyday life. So this is the premises already from the outset. We need to explain why we don't see them in our everyday life and then how we could see them if we do uh, more um, special experiments or more special observations. Um, so the, the most common Kaluza klein um, way to understand why we wouldn't see the extra dimensions right now is because they're compactified. They're so small um, that we don't, we don't even, we, we can spread along those extra dimensions ourselves. We are possibly even going along those extra dimensions, but it's extremely hard to do any uh, excitations along those extra dimensions. This is the type of degrees of freedom that Rogers is talking about. And so we would need to go to colliders or to energy scales, which are so beyond what is accessible at the moment um, and that would ever be accessible that we can't really probe that uh, directly if they're really compactified on extremely small uh, circles. Um, one thing which is quite remarkable is that when string theory proposed the, the need of extra dimensions, in principle, it could have come up with any number of extra dimension. It could have been a negative number. It, can, uh, it could not have been an integer. And the fact that string theory requires an integer, positive integer number of dimension already, that's really a good sign that <laughs> is not completely crazy. When you think about it, that's our idea. <laughs> I mean, I love the fact that you're laughing about this and I'm thinking it's a non-physicist. <laughs> I'm glad it's a number um, <laughs> that we can all agree upon. Uh, but there could be extra dimension, and in um, in in string theory, which w w we call M theory, a, a slight um, revised version of, of string theory, which M stands for whatever you want, mother, magic, uh, <laughs> uh, whatever. So, so M theory um, connects different uh, types of string theory together, 
uh, you would have for this connection the need for one potential extra dimension, which is large in, in the sense that not large in, in, in everyday life, but is not of the string scale, is not compactified on extremely, extremely small distances. And then the reason we wouldn't observe these extra dimension in our everyday life is because all the matter fields, everything that we are made out of and all of the other fundamental forces that we are made out of, they are confined on a surface in our membrane, in our brain, in this extra dimension. A little bit as if we're living on the surface of a pond, but the water itself the, the, has a depth, and so this depth would be the extra dimension. If you are an, a creature living on the surface of this pond, you wouldn't experience um, the depth of the water per se in our everyday life, but there would still be consequences you can look for. Um, and so fishes swimming in the sea or in, in, in the pond could ultimately uh, have an effect on you, maybe eat you. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's a, a, a smaller... Uh, that would be a very strange twist <laughs> to this whole experience if a fish but, turned up and ate us all. But the extra dimension could be uh, probed by gravity. There's something quite fundamental is gravity probes everything. We can never escape gravity and the extra dimensions themselves wouldn't escape gravity. So it always comes down to gravity itself. Through gravity, we have a chance to probe and possibly have evidence for or against extra dimensions. It's really interesting. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I've never even thought about... Um, how my diff how different dimensions might be folded. I mean, you're talking about these very compacted, yeah, very yeah. small dimensions, and suddenly I'm finding myself thinking, that's a good point. I've never considered the size or the scale or the hierarchy of these dimensions. So when we talk about higher dimensions, I sort of intuitively assume they must be larger, that our realities, our the dimensions within which we exist are within that. But it sounds like you're saying the other way. It's the other way around, in fact, that, that these dimensions are smaller and that we pass through them. I mean, and then of course, exactly you're right to point out the question of how do you measure something that's really important, right? Like to prove whether or not something does or doesn't exist, you have to be able to measure it. And so we were we were asking, you know, is there any evidence? It sounds like there is none. Um, but the second part of the question is, could we have evidence? Could we accrue that evidence? And you were saying that actually gravity is the key to, to potentially being able to do that, despite the, these differences in the scales or the dimensions of these these um, uh, dimensions, dimensions of these dimensions. Um, Absalom, what, what do you think? Do you think that we could at least find out whether or not there are any, or do you just outright reject their existence? I think that there is another branch of science that we should consider, which is not less important, not less important than relativity theory, and this is quantum mechanics. They are about the same age. Quantum mechanics tells us something very radical about both space and time, and it keeps telling us that there is something about space and time that we do not understand. First of all, quantum mechanics shows us non-locality, um, that in some sense the quantum violates, uh, uh, quantum interactions violate a basic premise of relativity theory that nothing can move faster than light. Indeed, nothing goes faster than light. But when you take two, uh, uh, a few particles that, are, uh, that have interacted in the past and you measure one of them, then in zero time the other particle is somehow affected by this and vice versa. Here's another thing that quantum mechanics tells us about time. Take a simple photon. This is a, an exercise that Sir Roger loved to do in his, uh, in his lectures. And send it to a beam splitter, to a half-silvered mirror. Then you put two detectors on the two sides of the, of the beam splitter. So has it been an ordinary ray of light? It would be split, one half going through, one being reflected. If it's a single photon, you don't know. In 50% of the cases, that detector will click. In the other 50, that detector will click. Physics tells you that there is no way to know, uh, to predict what will happen, which means that at every quantum interaction, there is something new added to our universe. Our universe is being created moment after moment, interaction after interaction fairly contrary to the relativistic view of the universe as a four-dimensional or many more dimensional block universe. There is something which goes beyond dimensionality. Let me imagine another thing. Quantum mechanics tells you, actually, if you believe in block universe, you cannot change the, the future. You say, I can't change the future. Here, I'm changing it. I'm banging my head in the wall. 
But if you are a real determinist like Einstein or Spinoza, they will tell you that it is your, the, the initial conditions of your brain and uh, your nervous system uh, were such that you will, and you having this rebellious character, are such that when you hear that there is uh, everything can be predicted, I could predict that you will do something unpredictable. So it, it's a straight jacket that you cannot escape. But here is what quantum mechanics tells you. Not only you can change the future, you can change the past in a very strange way. We have shown a few experiments in which you make a quantum experiment and then you leave something in the past uh, uncertain, according to uncertainty principle, and then later you affect it. Lo and behold, the effect goes not only from the uh, present to the future, but also from the present to the past. Sometimes it can zigzag, just like in science, uh, science fiction dimension. It can zigzag for time and appear at another place. That's one of the simplest, uh, most parsimonious explanations to the EPR paradox. And there is more to that with I would love to uh, uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> mention later. I don't disagree per se with anything you said, but you have to be careful when you say things affect the past. You are not sending information in the past. You are not actually twisting the present to have another outcome of what would have happened in the past. Actually, we do. No, I would disagree with that. I'll, I'll send you to a paper by Aharonov, Smolin, Cohen, and myself, The Quantum Liar Paradox. This is an EPR experiment in which there are two entangled particles, but you measure them not only for the spins, you just ask one of the particles, are you entangled with the other particle? And in half of the cases, it, it tells you I'm not entangled. Now we show by Bell's inequality that the answer of the particle, I'm not entangled with the other particle, comes for entanglement. That's a paradox. And that means that sometimes you can rewrite the history of the universe in a way that later leaves some strange marks on it. So I would, with all due respect, I would say that in some profound sense, even the past can be affected. I respectfully disagree. Uh, Sir Roger? No, I mean, there's some very interesting ways of, of looking at this, which I, I've been thinking about re recently, but not all that recently. That you, there are certain effects which propagate backwards in time, but these are what I call quantum reality. You have to make a distinction between classical reality and quantum reality. And this is the important thing that the effects that we've just been hearing about, that um, Absalom has been talking about, are, are these EPR effects, Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen effects, which do propagate back in time. But this is quantum reality, which projects back in time. Now, quantum reality has this effect that you can you can confirm it, but you can't ascertain it. You see, you, you see these things in quantum mechanics. You have a, a particle with a certain spin, and you can, if you know what that spin is, you can confirm it by an experiment. If, if the answer comes out, yes, you got it right every time. But if you want to ask what that particle spin is, which way it's pointing, that's not a question it answers. So you, you, the, the quantum reality of the spin is something which you can confirm, which you cannot ascertain. And if you could ascertain it, you could violate the speed of light things. And so it's a, it's a very intriguing difference between these notions of reality. And quantum reality behaves rather differently from the classical reality, with these certainly retroactive effects, which look as though they're propagating information into the past. But it's not information, because it's only quantum information. And quantum information is not something you can ascertain. You can simply confirm. If you think you know what it is, you can try and see whether you got it right or not. And if you don't know what it is, you haven't any idea, you can't ask the system what it is. You can ask it, but it doesn't tell you. And this is the kind of thing, and it's very interesting, the things you've just been talking about, I find that most intriguing. But I think you can understand them in relation to this, these different concepts of classical reality and quantum reality. The quantum reality does have this retro retroactive effect. It goes back in time. It goes back along the past light curve, actually. It doesn't go directly back in time. These things are interesting. Um, we don't say anything about the dimensionality of space, though. That's another question, which I gather is the discussion that you're having today. And there are many fascinating things about quantum mechanics. Absolutely right. And these things don't give you a picture of a sort of set universe, if you like, the, I don't know, the block universe, I suppose, it's one way of thinking about it. 
But that's the classical reality. The classical reality is something that doesn't describe the entire universe. You need to understand this quantum aspect too. It doesn't require going into larger numbers of dimensions. Now, I'm not saying you can't have it. I think that's a misinterpretation of what I was trying to say. It's just that if you have a theory which requires more than three space dimensions, it's got to be a pretty funny kind of theory, which is not like the kinds of theory we have now. If you have a theory which just simply adds an extra number of dimensions to the space, you're going to run into trouble because those functions of those actual, actually extra dimensions, the functional freedom involved, will swamp everything else. And although we've heard about this possibility, you must reject it and all that stuff, sure. I'm not rejecting it. I'm just saying that any theory which involves more than three space dimensions would be a very different kind of theory, and you've got to explain why functions of those extra degrees of freedom don't swamp everything else. Maybe you could have such a theory. It would be quite unlike anything I've seen, certainly in string theory, or any of the models which I've seen today. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.